Luke 23, 44 to 49. Let's read. God is the Lord of faith. 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 He is the Lord of faith because what he speaks, he surely acts. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 says that. Whatever he speaks, whatever he says he will do, he surely acts acts it. He surely does it. Do you believe that about God? That he surely keeps his word. He's not like us. You have to trust in God. You have to believe in God because he alone can do that. Um, So when you say God is the Lord of faith, you believe in the Lord of faith, you believe that he keeps all his promises. He does what he says he will. Because nothing is too hard for him. As Genesis uh, chapter 18 verse 14 reminds us, Nothing is too hard for him. In other words, nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? (laughs) Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too difficult. Nothing is impossible in God. So that makes him the Lord of faith. So if you believe in this God, it means you trust in God. Do you trust in God? What does your dollar say? (laughs) Huh? (laughs) It's like, what does your dollar say? In God we trust, right? So um, having the foundation of... uh, you know, uh, the country having the foundation of Christianity or Christian uh, faith, uh, whoever came up with the dollar bill um, decided to put that in there, in God we trust. Um, not in the money, but in God. Unfortunately, most people trust in that money and forget what's written uh, on that bill. But we trust in God because he alone is the Lord of faith. And if you trust in God... How should you live your daily life? What what should your daily life look like? It means it should look like um, you committing all your precious things to him. Committing your life, committing your time, committing your talents, committing even your problems to him. Because who is him? Who is he? He is the Lord of faith. Because he surely does what he says. You can trust him. People say, trust me. How many times have you heard that? Trust me. Why do they say that? Because we can't trust them. They can't be trusted. And that's why they say, trust me. Believe me. Don't you believe me? Trust me. All the more they say, the less trust you have for them. Because this whole world um, cannot be trusted. Men in this world cannot be trusted. I cannot trust myself. You've heard that before, too. But God can be trusted. He alone should be, uh, we, alone, we, we should trust him in him alone. And when we say we do with our lips, we ought to express it with our lives. And that is to commit all our precious things into his hands. Why do we need to do that? Because after our last breath, we want to commit our soul into his hands. As we just read um, the passage that describes the death of Christ, uh, Jesus on the cross, as he breathed his last, last, he let out a cry saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Receive my spirit. I entrust, I send. I send. I leave my soul, my spirit, into your hands. That is or those words ought to be our very last words as we breathe our last. And that's what we should pray for every night. And I hope by the end of the sermon, uh, you are convinced and you are encouraged to do that. Because if this were your last breath, if you knew that this was your last moment, you, and you knew you were not going to wake up tomorrow morning, what would be your last words? What would be your last prayer? Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I commit my soul. Is that true for you? Because if he, he has my spirit in his hands, then what happens to me? I'm saved. But if he doesn't have my spirit in his hands after I die, then I'm not saved. So for that to happen, because that is the goal of our spiritual life, the reason why you come today is for that moment. For us to have that come true for, uh, for our soul in the life after death, We need to, therefore, every day commit to him whatever belongs, whatever is given to us. 
Because all the things that we have in our hands, in our flesh, in our lives, belong to him. Do you remember that song? He's got the whole world in his and he's got the whole world. In his and he's got the whole world. In his and he's got the whole world in his hands. Do you believe that? Just like that Sunday school song, you know? He's got the whole world in his hands. You like to sing that song, but when it comes to really living it, it's a challenge. And that's why I'm here to encourage you and encourage myself as well through this word today. Um, but in the world, people, as they live each and every day, they trust in something. There's underlying trust. And most of the time, it is trust in themselves. And it's called, or we can express it as self-confidence. You know, they have confidence that things will go well. When they get in the car, start the car, they won't get into car accident or, or a deadly car accident. That they will get through the day okay. That they will get to their workplace okay. And they will make money okay. And they will live this day okay. And where does that faith come from? It's based on their experience. It didn't happen yesterday. It's not going to happen today. And maybe it won't happen tomorrow. It was okay. I did it this way yesterday, so I can do it this way, this way today. And it will be okay. All based on experience and my now, you know, your own knowledge. So based on that, people trust that their life uh, will be the same. Right? Because you don't wake up today thinking today is my last day of, you know, the last day of my life, unless you are uh, battling and, you know, with t some terminal disease. You think that it's going to be the same, especially the young people. Uh, and those of you in this room being young, you would think that you'll live forever, forever young. Uh, because, you know, you, you think only old people die. But you know it's not true at the same time. Um, because people trust in this sort of vague idea based on their self-confidence, um, they put money in the banks. And hopefully the money will be there when you go to the ATM machine. Um, but, you know, if you think about money, it's a very abstract thing, especially when you deposit those checks. You don't have the cash, uh, and you put that piece of paper in there, and then you have number, digital number on the screen that says you have a certain amount in the account. How do you know it's in there? Is it in that place, in that location of the bank, in the safe, safety box? Where's the money? If you don't know where the money is, I don't know where it is, nobody knows. But you believe it's going to be there when you need it. I don't need to withdraw my money. Give me my money back. Oh, spent on child education. Give me my money back. I remember that. <laughs> anyway. So where's my money? You know, I spent it all. That. You know, you think that it's going to be there tomorrow, but it may not be there. And that's what happened when the banks collapsed uh, in 2007, 2008 with the financial uh, crisis. Banks said, sorry, we don't have your money. Yet people keep depositing money in their banks because banks are more trustworthy than your uh, mattresses at home. People give their wealth to managers, right? So Wall Street run, runs on, uh, is full of uh, people like that. They manage other people's wealth and they are given the task to trade, to buy, to sell, exchange, and all that to increase profit for the owners. Um, if something happens to you, like you got into a car accident, you get sued, who do you look for help? Your attorney, you hire a, a lawyer, and you hope that they will handle your case as best and as honest as possible, as worth as the money that you pay uh, to them. You also trust your government to politicians, and you know the presidential election coming just in a, a less, you know, a little more than a month, uh, l less than two months. Um, people hope that whoever gets into the White House will take care of the government honestly and as best as they can, so they vote. Um, Parents send their children to schools hoping that schools will take care of them. We go to back to school night and listen to what teachers have to say and say, I hope this teacher is good. If this teacher knows what she's talking about or what he's talking about. You know, and, and everyone was complaining, she's not funny. You know, compared to my first my, compared to my first grade teacher, my second grade teacher is not funny. We're like, oh, that's too bad. So we go there and, I, and Bob, Bob was saying, she knows what she's talking about. So we say, it's okay, she's not funny. She knows what she's doing. That's all matters. <laughs> She's not funny. So, um, you know, kids like funny teachers. But at this point, we, heard learn, we want her to learn her grammar, her spelling, and her writing, and her math, and all that. So um, we hope that our teachers are competent uh, to take care of our children and educate them. And when you have young children, uh, as I did when Erin was just five, six months, I had to go to teach. So she went to daycare. And you hope that they will really take care of uh, nannies or whatever. They will take care of your babies. Um, all based on your experience. And when you are sick, you commit, uh, you trust your body. 
to doctors, to hospital. And when you go under the uh, you know, anesthesia, that they won't cut the wrong leg, that they will take out the right kidney, that everything will be okay when you wake up. So all these things are based on trust and based on self-confidence that things will go okay based you know, again, you make your judgment based on your experience, your knowledge, and you make the uh, you make the choice, and hopefully, it will come out positive. But unfortunately, what happens is not all those um, choices are right. We hear horrible stories about terrible teachers, and uh, you know, people who are abusive in so many horrible ways. Uh, we hear about people who are dishonest, then they rob people of their money, and they take money for their own. And politicians, corruption everywhere. So we see that, that the trust that men have on their own, based on their own experience and knowledge, uh, is not perfect. That it is not um, flawless. Rather, it, is, you know, prone, uh, it, is, uh, it can have many uh, errors and um, regrets in the end. However, when we look at the Bible, there is more important, there's more pressing question that we need to deal with, the choice that we need to make, and that is to whom? Will or should I commit my soul? To whom? In, uh, in whose hands? Into whose hands um, shall I commit my soul? This is a critical and the most pressing issue at hand for all of us. Because uh, you may know your birthday, but you don't know when you, uh, your death date, right? You don't know when you're going to die. And People live as though this is one life to live. They don't think about the life after death, and that's why they don't know about God, and they don't c can care less about him. Uh, but when they do die, as the Bible tells us, and as we believe the scripture, uh, is that there is life after death. And if you don't resolve this problem while you're alive, this question, to whom? To whom will I commit my soul? Then you are in trouble. If you resolve the, uh, the problem, you, you, you have the answer for that question and you live for it, then when you die, when you breathe your last breath, then your soul, uh, as it's committed to the Father, will be taken to him and taken to his house. But uh, if that's not the case, then the spirit of man dwells, stays in this world. Um, because we, uh, we are all spirit. When we lose the flesh, we either have to go to the Father in heaven or it is sent to hell, heaven or hell. But as you have uh, learned, many of you have already learned in Logos and through the sermon, that the place that's go going to become the fire, uh, the lake of fire, hell, is the universe. It's Hades. So in, uh, in Greek, it's Hades, the world or the underworld or hell. Um, is where the spirits that do not commit, they have not committed their soul to God, will remain, will remain. And in the end, the result will be hell. So I ask you to listen very carefully this morning and make that decision, choose. Uh, and to whose hand you will commit your soul daily so that when that day comes, that there'll be no question or doubt, that you will be in the hands of the Father God, amen? So when God made man, he made him the dust, the flesh, this visible being outside, and into him he breathed his breath. Because God is spirit, his breath is spirit. So that breath made the flesh man, spiritual man. So let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Look around and see if anyone needs help with this, finding the verse. Okay, let's read that together. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into him his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. What did the man become? The man became a living being. How? How did he become a living being? God's breath, the breath of life. In Hebrew, it's called ruah, and it is spirit. Right. Spirit comes from spirit, so God being spirit, he breathed his breath, that is spirit, into the man, and the man became a spiritual being or living being. Altogether, a living being. Living being. In Hebrew, it's called Adam. Right. So the man was named Adam, but he really was Adam uh, in terms of the, his essence, that he is spiritual being. Now, to him, and then you see in verse 17, God gives him... Uh, were to live by. Now, before he gives him this command, Adam is given uh, a responsibility, a stewardship 
uh, to take care of the garden. So God entrusts Adam with the garden. And the garden uh, is described in the previous you know, section of the Bible there uh, as being paradise on earth, earthly paradise. It was a beautiful place. And it was so, um, uh, so uh, flourishing with life and, and vegetation and fruit and the rivers flowing out from there that you know, men are still in search for this type of earthly paradise. But they will never find it because... There is no more, uh, as we will go over in a few minutes. But that was the kind of place that Adam and Eve lived, and Adam had, had the responsibility to take care of it. God committed the garden into the hands of Adam. Even though it belongs to God, Adam was given uh, the garden to take care of it, to be a steward. And for him to have and continue to have this responsibility and authority, he had a condition, and that was to live by the word of God. Because he is a living being, spirit needs to eat spirit food. And the food is the word of God. And the word that God gave him was in verse 17, Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Again, you being there, the one that God is speaking to, is not, was not the man, the flesh, Adam, but the spirit, Adam, the spiritual being, the living being. Now, did he eat it, though? Did he eat the fruit or not? Yes, he did. And how did he eat it? There was a serpent, uh, and we find out that he is the, uh, the devil, who approached Eve first and tempted her to eat the fruit so that they would become like God. Of course, that was lie. Instead of becoming like God, they had sinned. They had become hidden from the face of God. Eve ate the fruit, Adam ate the fruit, and immediately they felt fear uh, for God and for the price of their sin, the sin that they had just committed. So sin entered their spirit, and death entered. And to, uh, for them to realize this status, the spiritual reality for them, and therefore all mankind, God banished them from the garden. That's why I said there is no more earthly paradise. No man can ever find or establish this type of paradise on earth. Um, because after God had uh, banished Adam and Eve out of the garden, God had placed a flaming sword at the end of chapter 3, Genesis there in verse 27, 28, describes that. A flaming sword represents uh, angels guarding the, gar uh, the garden so they may never return to it. They may never have the access to this earthly paradise. Not only that, that this represented the broken relationship between God and men. So then what we have is instead of mutual trust, what we have is mutual distrust. Yes, the flaming sword represented the mutual distrust between God and men. God no longer then trusted in men, and men no longer in God. So this is why people are so resistant and so rebellious about believing God. As you feel that every time you try to preach to someone or even try to give someone faith, no, 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 I don't really believe that. No, 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 no. Why? It's because of Adam's sin. The ancestor of all mankind lost trust in God and God in all men um, so that they were banished from the garden, hidden from God. But we see from the rest of the Bible, there is the history of then uh, restoring, God restoring this relationship between God and men. God begins his work to restore this relationship, trust relationship, trust between God and men. How did he do that? He began by giving faith to men. Faith became law, by, became mechani a mechanism or the mechanism through which their relationship, our relationship to God would become restored. So Hebrews chapter 11 outlines the fathers of faith, the forefathers of faith, of uh, the men of the Old Testament. And of course, Noah uh, was one of them. God, when God warned Noah of flood that was going to take place almost 100 years after, because he spent 70 years to build the, the ark, that's about a century, and they lived a long time back then. So uh, it was like tomorrow for them, 100 years. A anyhow, it was long, long um, uh, d distance away from his time, yet by faith, Noah obeyed. Noah trusted when he was warned of the flood, and he faithfully built the ark. It took him years and years doing the same thing and being mocked by other people, but he obeyed the word of God, obeyed the commandment of God, and built the ark. So as a result, he and his family were saved. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, he became an heir of righteousness or an heir of faith. 
So the flood that God sent, or the water that God sent to the world, came from upstairs, downstairs, everywhere, was filled with water, killed everything and everyone that breathed through its nostrils except for eight people. Isn't God love? Didn't we talk about love of God last week? God is love. Yes, he is love. But we do also have to understand that he is the Lord of faith. What he wants to save, listen, what he wants to save is not many, but those few with faith. What he wants to save is faith. What he is seeking is faith. What he wants is faith. So from that incident, uh, that event of the great flood and Noah's, um, Noah's family being saved, we learn how God cherishes those few with faith. And of course, when you talk about faith, you have to talk about Abraham. Uh, Abraham, uh, by faith, when he was called to leave his home, he left. He left to go to a place where he'd later, he would later receive as his inheritance. He didn't know where he was going, but he left. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Did he know where he was going? No. He had lived a comfortable life. He was pretty well-to-do, and he was pretty much settled in his country. Um, and then suddenly God told him to go to a place where he did not know. And then later, God said, you are going to receive this land as your inheritance. Even though he didn't know what was going to happen, by faith, he believed and he obeyed and went. And then later on, at the age of 100, he received a son. When he was a child, he and his wife were childless. They were beyond the, uh, the age of bearing children. They were no longer fertile. But because God promised them, they, by faith, they believe. By faith, they believe that nothing is too hard for God. Do you believe that? And what happened? They had a baby. They had a baby at the age of 100, when Abraham was 100. So what did they name the baby? Isaac. And what does the name Isaac mean? Laughter. So why did they laugh? Oh, we finally had a baby. <laughs> See, we have a boy too. You don't know. You, you were making fun of us, but we have a son. Well, maybe that was a little bit in there too, but they laughed. Because the word of God came true, that God had returned to him as he promised that he would uh, a, late, a year later. So they received the, uh, that one son, Isaac, and, and all the more their faith became stronger. And then a little bit later, when Isaac came of age, and it was around maybe when he was 20 years old, back then... They were a little slower, so they came of age a little uh, older. Nowadays, you know, preteens, they're smart. They figure things out. But Isaac was around 20 years old, and when, uh, when he was about 20 years old, God told him to give Isaac as a burnt sacrifice. Oh, my God, is he like... Does he give and, and then take back? What is he? Is he so cheap that he gives and then he gives them joy, and then suddenly he's going to make them miserable by taking away their only son? What it says here in verse 17, if you look at chapter 11, verse 17 eight, uh, to 19, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now God had told Isaac to give Isaac, uh, uh, God, God had told Abraham to give Isaac as his sacrifice, and he told him to go to a specific place, Mount Moriah, uh, to give the sacrifice, and God gave a specific time. So you have to travel a couple of times, and then a couple of days, and then go to this place. Now when, uh, when I, uh, Abraham was traveling with the servant and his son, they had taken all the supplies that they needed, the wood, the fire, everything. And then by the time they left the servant, it was just Abraham and Isaac going up to the, the top of the mount, mountain. Isaac, at the age of 20, now puts two and two together and says, Father, there's wood, there's fire. Something is missing. <laughs> Something's missing. What's missing, guys? The sacrifice, the animal. So Isaac is figuring out one, two, 
guess who's going to be the sacrifice? So, um, you know, Isaac, if he, even though as a 20-year-old young man, didn't have faith, he could have been, what is wrong with you, father? Are you going see now? You're going to kill me? And he's going to do the, you know, and that's I'm going to, I'm going to get out of here. But Isaac also had faith that he obliged to his father. He went along with his father. When his father bound him on top of the altar that he had built, Isaac did not put up a fight. So not only did Abraham have faith, but also Isaac, by faith, was ready to give his life as a burnt offering. So Abraham, when he was about to raise his arm to stab him, slaughter his own son, his only, one and only son that he begot at the age of 100, he was ready to kill him. He, was, he already killed his son in his heart. He just needed to do it physically. And when he was about to do it, then God was so moved by the faith of Abraham. God said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. Do not touch your hand on this lad. Do not kill him. I now know that you fear me. You worship me. You obey me. You trust me. Because Abraham, it says, he reasoned that God could raise the dead. Because he believed that his body and Sarah's body, uh, their bodies were already dead when they uh, re uh, received the promise of God to have a baby. So it was the impossible being done. So then uh, he also, by faith, he trusted that even though Ab uh, Isaac would die, that God will raise him up from the dead. So with this faith, by this faith, Abraham obeyed. And he did not have to kill Isaac. And as Genesis 22, 13 says, God prepared a ram to be given as burnt offering instead of Isaac. Do you believe that? Amen. That's what makes him Abraham man of great faith because he trusted God. From Isaac also came Jacob. Jacob uh, was surely man of faith. He, he was a man who truly trusted in God as well. When he had run away from his brother who wanted to kill him for stealing his birthright years after, uh, he became a rich man. Jacob had uh, two wives and two maidservants, and had 12 sons, and plus daughters, and livestock. He was a wealthy man. But he knew that as he was going back to his father's home, crossing the river, he heard the news that his brother was coming to meet him. He knew that his brother was not going to come and throw a party for his return. His brother was coming to kill him. So Jacob got desperate, and the first thing that he, do, he did that we need to learn from, uh, from him, because his desire was to go back to the father's house, his father being Isaac, uh, he wanted to go back to his father's home, that father's land. What he did was send ahead all his possessions across the river. In the order of the least most precious to the most precious, he sent away one by one. And then he sent away as gift to, uh, uh, he sent away the gift to his brother to move his heart as well. And what he did was he knelt down. He knelt down before God and he began to pray. So what he did in the, in the midst of this desperate situation, he sent away what was precious to him and he committed all these things, including his children, his sons, in the hands of God. So when the man of God appeared in the middle of the night, he wrestled against him and the man gave him, as a result, blessing in the name Israel. So Jacob's name is now changed to Israel. This was blessing from God. And with his name Israel, he crossed the river with nothing. Then when he did cross the river, he met his brother. What did his brother do? He hugged him and kissed him and said, welcome home, bro. Welcome home. I haven't seen you all these years. You look good. All these things, who are they? All these people, who are they? Oh, they're my children. They're my... He says, you know what? You stay here. You stay in the good part of the land. I'm going to go over there. Do you know where you're going? Let me show you the way. So Esau was suddenly a changed man. He had a change of heart. And it says in Genesis 33 that Isaac, uh, Jacob then later safely camped in Canaan. He safely camped in the land of Canaan in the father's home. Then came the people, the children of Israel. Just as God promised Abraham that the children of Israel would be in a foreign land for four generations, and then after that time, God would bring them out. Before they were brought out of uh, 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 Egypt, before they became slaves, what happened was that they, were in, they went to Egypt from Canaan to look for food. Right? If you remember the story of Jacob when he becomes older and the 12 sons, and Joseph gets sold as slave out of jealousy of the brothers, uh, later on, there was a famine that struck that whole part of the world so that Jacob and his sons had to go to Egypt to look for food. How did they get the food when, we went, when they went to Egypt? 
Because of Joseph, Joseph was sold by their brothers, but it was God who sent ahead Joseph to prepare food for Israel. Do you believe that? That's how God works. God sends ahead. And that when you come to him in need with empty hands, relying on him alone, he prepares and he gives what he prepared for you. Amen. And when they were released from the hands of the Pharaoh later on, so, so they settled in Egypt and they had many children and generation, generation later, and the Pharaoh changes, and then they become slaves of the Pharaoh. Their lives become very difficult. Then God sends Moses to bring them out. Now, when they were brought out, they were brought into the desert where there is no food or drink. And then when they went into the desert, the men had said in Psalm, uh, as, as it's in Psalm 78, 19, will God spread a table in the desert? Is there a table? Is there a dining hall in the desert? Watch them go and die. But did God spread a table for them in the desert? Did God provide for them food in the desert? Yes, in the form of manna and quails and water from rocks. Do you believe that? Yeah. That God sent ahead, prepare ahead for them. So when God uh, commanded them to build a sanctuary, they remember, while right, looking at the tabernacle and later the temple, that they ought to trust in the Lord God alone, in the name of the Lord God alone, that when they trust in God, that God would feed them, God will heal them, God will deliver them. So they trusted that one day God would deliver them from the hands of their enemies and, 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 and finally be restored. Their kingdom will be restored. So they held them to the temple of Jerusalem with all their hopes, with all their obsession, with all their passion. So the temple was very important. It stood as a reminder that they ought to have trust in God. So when Jesus, the Son of God, came and looked at the temple, what did he say that made them so angry to the point of wanting to kill him? Destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. Jesus said, looking at this temple, that meant everything to the people of Israel, especially at that time. Destroy this and I'll raise it again in three days. Well knowing this will create anger and therefore conspiracy to kill him. But what Jesus was referring to was the temple of his body. Altogether, the temple of his body. The temple of his body. I know the Old Testament is when you all have to go through like the Israelites walking in the desert. Oh, my God. It's so long. Why do we have to always go through this? Your part is coming. Just hold on. Because, but for you to get to your part, you need to understand how God worked over the history of man, history of the Bible. To, for you to rely on him. Remember that. Why do, God, why do men trust in other men and systems of the world? Because of their experience and knowledge. Based on their experience, they throw themselves, their lives, their children, all investments. So who do we need to trust? We need to trust in God. How are we going to trust him? We have to see over the history how he has worked through the experience of men of faith. That's why you need to learn about that. That's why you need to hear about it, even if it sounds uninteresting and irrelevant to you. So when Jesus said, destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days, what was he speaking of? The temple of his body, that he was going to die but be risen in how many days? In three days. What was he going to accomplish through his death and his resurrection? He was going to reveal that he is the one that all men ought to trust. Trust with not just their physical things, but their most precious treasure, and that is their soul. Because at the time, the Jews, the people of the children of Israel, had trusted in the Lord God, in the name of the Lord God, the name of uh, Jehovah, that was reminded through the temple. They trusted in the temple. They trusted, even in their bloodline, that as long as they were sons, children of Abraham, God will take care of them. You realize that, right? Their trust was all in earthly things. But here's Jesus saying, you don't need to trust. You must no longer trust in earthly, physical things like the temple or even your bloodline. You need to trust instead in me because I am the one who's going to make a way for you to come into the heavenly land, into the Father's house in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Who is he? Yes, he is Jesus, but where did he come from? He came from the Father. Again, let's read it. John 1. I know, same thing every week, same thing. But if you listen carefully, I'm saying to you something different every week. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God 
in the beginning. So he there, first the word. The word is the self-manifestation of God. This is when God decided to become the word, to manifest himself as the word, because no man will know God unless God himself decides to reveal himself. Do you agree with that? You cannot know God because you fast so many days or you pray so many days. Only when God decides to reveal himself to you, then you know. And that's what God decided. And the way he was going to reveal himself was as the word, as logos. And the word became flesh when it was time. Let's go to verse 14 there. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Came from where? He came from the Father. In verse 18, it also says, No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, may, has made him known. So where did Jesus come from? From the Father. So who knows the Father the best? The Son, the Word, the Word. Who is God? God is the Lord of faith. So from God, the Lord of faith, came the Word in the form of man in flesh. That's what we call incarnation. He is the incarnate Word the, because the Word became flesh. Spirit became flesh. He is the incarnate Word, the incarnate Spirit. Even though He came as man, who is in need of all the things that we do, we have, uh, who, uh, that we, we also are in, yet he, by his essence, is God, is spirit, is the word. And he said in John 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Let's say that together. Trust in God. Trust, God. Trust, also in Trust also in me. Trust in God. Trust also in? Jesus. In Jesus. Not you. Uh-uh. Not you. You shouldn't trust yourself, really. Trust in God and trust also in Jesus. Because he knew that the Jews were instilled with this faith in trusting in the Lord God and trusting in the temple, trusting in the commandment, trusting in their bloodline. And here is God, Jesus saying, God himself, you trust in God? Good. Trust also in me. And the men thought that Jesus was being blasphemous. He's, only, he's just a man, a mere man, a creation. How can he say trust in him? Because they did not know who Jesus is. Jesus is God manifested in flesh. He's the part of God that was planned to come as man. Why? Because he was going to become the way, the way to the Father, as he said in verse 6 of chapter 14. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was going to die and be risen through his thorn torn flesh. He was going to pave a road for men to come to the Father, once again have this trust relationship. So that's what he showed during the miracles that he performed. One time he was out of preaching in the wilderness, and they had, the men had been fo uh, following him, and they were so mesmerized by, mesmerized by his teaching that they forgot that they didn't have any food. They started, there was grumbling in their stomach. They realized, oh my God, what is that noise? Oh my God, we haven't eaten for days. We have no food. And the disciples came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, these men have no food. Send them to the town so that they can go get food. And what did Jesus say? They do not need to go away. And then they said a little bit later, oh, we found a boy with two fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Give them to me. Then there's a little boy going, oh, my God, that's my lunch. <laughs> but something about Jesus, even as a young boy, he saw and he decided to trust Jesus. He decided to, oh, to Jesus. He laid them down in the hands of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He grabbed the food in his hands and looked to the heavens, and he blessed the food. With that food, that little food good enough for just a young boy, he was able to feed thousands. 5,000 men ate, and there were 12 baskets full of remainders. Do you believe that? What happens when you, when you put your problems into the hands of God, into the hands of Jesus? He takes care of them. Hallelujah. But first thing you need to do is to lay them into his hands. So we also see that when there was a storm out in the sea, when the disciples uh, were out there with Jesus, they were, they were 
they were panicking. They knew that the storm was going to drown them. And there was Jesus snoring the night away. They were like, oh, my God, get your bucket. Row, row, row. Oh, my God, everything is connected. Row, get the bucket. What should we do? Yeah, they were throwing all this stuff. Tell them to keep rowing. Okay, keep rowing. So that's what they're doing. You're still clueless. Watch the DVD, guys. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, we had this joke. Ryan and I were saying, like, I was saying all the lines for weeks and weeks. I was doing the whole play by myself, right? Dylan, you too, right? All of us doing all the, the lines. It was in our blood and system. So, um, so they were saying, keep rowing, throw the water out of the boat. And then they finally said, Jesus, don't you care that we are drowning? Aren't you going to do something? Man, like Jesus, get the bucket yourself. Get up. Pick up, you know, throw some water off the boat. Why was Jesus pretending like he was, well, he was asleep, but why did he pretend like he didn't know what was going on? He waited until they came to him for help. He did not wake up on his own and say, get out of here. Get out of here. Let me fix this problem. He waited and waited. And when they got so desperate, said, Jesus, what are you doing? Don't you care? We're drowning. Help us. Then Jesus got up without shouting or screaming. He said, be still. And then everything calmed down. Do you believe that? Yeah. Also in, the, uh, in the, um, the event of the wedding at Can uh, Cana in John 2, there was a wedding and they ran out of wine. And they were panicking. They didn't know what to do. Wine runs out. There's no more wedding party. So then Mary said to Jesus, they ran out of uh, wine. And what did Jesus say? Dear woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> First of all, he's calling Mary woman, his mother. And then he says, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Then Mary, this also shows Mary really did conceive Jesus, who is the son of God. She just lent his, her body to him because she knew who Jesus uh, is. So she went and told the servants, do whatever he says. So when, when Mary told Jesus about what was happening, she was inviting him. She was seeking his help. To, to, to help, uh, seeking his help, for this situa his, his help for this situation. And he said, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. They have not asked me for help unless they come to me. Unless they surrender their problems to me, I'm not going to get involved. But when the servants were ready, tell us what to do. Jesus told them to fill all the jars with water. What happened? Water turned into wine. Do you believe that? So in such a way, when only when men came to Jesus with their problems and surrender, committed into the hands of Jesus, then he, gave, he resolved their problems. He, he gave them the solution. But when it was time for his own death, Jesus did not help, help himself. He died. He died helplessly like a sinner. But when he died, what did he say? He said, it is finished. He declared, it is finished. Because it was the moment that he completed the work that was entrusted to him, he, the work that was committed to him by the Father. John 10, verse 17, 18 says, The Father gave him the command to come and lay down his life to die, to obey the Father. So the work that the Father committed to the Son, the Son through his death, he fulfilled it. His trust in the Father was fulfilled at the moment he died. Do you believe that? That's why Jesus said in Luke 23, 46, as we read, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I trust in you and you alone. There's no one else for me to look to except you. The only one who's going to save me from this Hades, this, this hell, is you. And the Father received his faith, his trust in him. Um, amen. So he condemned, through his death, he condemned the father of lies, the devil. And by shedding his blood, Jesus redeemed all sins, all sins of men. The sins that or inside our, the sin that, that is in our spirit that we inherited from Adam and the sins that we committed with our bodies, with our minds, with our lips. All the sins were put onto his body. And when he was broken and spilled out, he redeemed, took away our sins. Hallelujah. And as his flesh tore, the temple veil tore. So when the temple veil tore, I said this last week too, all men became in full view of God that it became open. God became open to all. His now, now the relationship between God and sinners can be restored, become open relationship. Trust relationship was restored through the death of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. 
So the father raised him from the dead, and Jesus sat on the throne in heaven, where he is now and forever. And Jesus is the Lord of faith. Can we say that together? The Lord of faith. Listen very carefully. This is about you. You want to be blessed? Do you want to be blessed? Yes. Do you, have you come here to be blessed? Yes. Then listen like this is for you. Where does blessing come from? Not exactly in your pockets or bank accounts or your wallets. This blessing is coming from here right now. Blessing for me is also coming from here too. So I trust that these words are based on the word of God and the Holy Spirit is speaking the words. Even though out of my mouth, a man like me, out of my mouth, these words are blessing to our souls. You believe that? Yeah. So listen like you care. Listen like you care. Jesus is the Lord of faith. Let's say that. The Lord of faith. Lord of faith. The Lord of faith. Lord of faith. Lord of faith. Who is the Lord of faith? Jesus is the Lord of faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, He is the author of faith. He is the finisher of faith. He is be the beginner, the alpha and omega of faith. Faith is Jesus. When you look at faith, what does faith look like? Well, we started Abraham, we started Noah, Jacob. No, faith is Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of faith. Hallelujah. Amen. He sent the Holy Spirit from heaven, and the Holy Spirit comes to souls who have been born again by the blood of Jesus. Who can be born again by the blood of Jesus? First, you have to know your soul. Do you know your soul? Say amen if you know you are a soul. Amen. I sure hope so. Because if you came as not a soul, this whole thing has nothing to do with you. You have wasted your time. I had, said, I had said worship is when you come in as a soul, as a spirit. Your qualification of coming to meet with God, to have a relationship with God, is not how many years you've been in church or how many good things you have done or how good of a heart you have, but it is that you are spirit. You enter into his presence as spirit. You can have a relationship with him as spirit. Do you believe that? That you are a spirit, you are a soul. If you are, know you are a soul, then you believe that you can receive the blood of Jesus, the redeeming precious blood of Jesus that washes away your sin, and that you can be born again, born a new creation. Do you believe that? Yes. Then the Holy Spirit comes and lets you know all the more that you are a soul, that you cherish your soul more than anything else in the world. This is where we run into trouble. So far, okay, I agree, I agree, but now here comes the application part. Do you know your soul? Amen. Do you believe that you've been born again? Amen. So are you trusting your soul? Amen. How are you living your life? You're living for your soul? Not this week. Not this season. Not this year. Maybe next year. When things go okay, when I finish school, when I finish my job, when I have my family, then I'll live for my soul. Or, oh, well, Monday through Saturday, I don't. But Sunday morning, 10 to 12, I do. Just as your flesh breathes, needs to breathe and live 24-7, so does your spirit. Your spirit does not live. Keep in mind on Sundays. If it's not alive Monday through Saturday, it does, it's not alive on Sunday either. If you know your soul, then you cherish your soul. Why? Because you receive the blood of Jesus, the blood of God. They gave life to you. New life is in you, growing through the blood of Jesus. And therefore, you cherish your soul. Who has great faith in this room? Well, you, Pastor. Well, what about all of you? And I can't say, I'm, yeah, I'm greater than you. I pray more than you. I preach. I, I'm better than you. No, it's not that. I know I'm a soul, and I love my soul. And because I love my own soul, I love your souls too. Do you know your soul? And do you cherish your soul? Like you cherish the money that's in your bank account. That you look at your bank statement and, oh, well, when I well, came in, how much interest have I gained? Oh, my God, the stock's going up and going down. I'm depressed because it's down. Oh, it's up. I'm happy. You are so interested in your money, but what about the well-being of your soul? Who is in care of your soul? That's the question I want to ask you today. Who is in care of your soul? And what are you doing about it? If you cherish your soul, 
then you would commit your soul to the good manager, good caretaker, just as you would take your child. You would do your best to find a good school for your child, good teacher, good piano teacher, good tutor for your child. You would all the more seek for the one who would take care of your soul. You will seek the one that you need to commit your soul to. And as I said to you before, when you die, your last breath, and I remind you, young people, you too, because I've seen young people die as well. Young or old, we all died. And when you die, you ought to know for 100% sure that your spirit, your soul is in the hands of the Father God. This is why you need to pray before you go to bed. Even a minute before you go to bed. Even it takes whatever, second, you need to pray, Father, even if I don't wake up this tomorrow morning, I trust in you. I commit my spirit into your hands, Father. Please receive my spirit. Because once you're dead, you can't do nothing about your spirit. That's it. You're either there or here, literally. You're either in the Father's presence or you're in hell. And how does, get determined? how does that destination get determined? Again, when, not when you're dead, not after you are gone and say, oh my God, can I ask my brother to pray for me? It doesn't happen. As we read in Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he said, the rich man said, please send Lazarus to preach to my brother so they can be saved and do something about it. No, once you're dead, that's it. There's no change of location. Once you're dead, it's dead. It's over. What you do now, therefore, matters. The last thing we want to hear, the thing that we never want to hear, is the Lord saying to us, I never knew you. The last thing, the one thing we never, ever want to hear is the Father saying, I never knew you. But I've gone to church for all these years. I've done all this. I cook for church. I play the piano. I, I drove the van. I did all this. I never knew you. What if he says those words to me? What can I do? There's nothing I can do then. That's why when I'm alive, I need to prepare. I need to prepare for that day to commit my spirit into his hands. So while I'm alive, I need to give my spirit in the care of the word of his grace and in his church. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 32. Chapter 20, verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So when Paul began to preach and start preaching these men and women, he, wa he was leaving them because he had to continue his mission, his journey of preaching. He cherished those souls and he felt so sorry for those souls and he needed those souls to be taken care of. And that's why churches had to be built across the world and be reminded that the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood, the blood of God. So the place where your spirit is taken care of while you're in flesh is the church. The church is where you ought to commit your spirit while you're alive so that when you are dead, your spirit is in the hands of the Father. It doesn't happen just because you're, you're last minute prayer, last minute prayer. Oh, I'll do whatever I want. I'll live for my flesh. You know, I'll just enjoy life. And then when I'm dying, receive my, receive my spirit, Father. How do you know? He's not going to say to you, I never knew you. I will shut the doors at your face. It is not how many years you've been coming to church. It is not what kind of work you have done. If that work is not for your spirit, if it is not for living for the soul. So the man of the spirit then having this faith and desire 
while they're alive, they commit their spirit to the church and to the word of his grace. So that in that day, their spirit will be in the hands of the Father. While they're alive, then they send ahead all their precious things, as Jacob did. Knowing the end is coming. That at any moment, his life can be taken away. He sent away all his precious things. That's why in our church, we have dedication part of the program. And I'm so great. I hope people can realize one day, it's not to burden your life. It is a blessing for you. Think about it. All of you who finish your dedication, you are now so relaxed, so laid back. Your spirit is down the hill again. Remember that? Remember that time in a month, in two weeks? You just, all you thought about was, how do I do this? How do I do this? Why? Because that was the time it was so concentrated and so pressed so that we can send ahead our time and our talent. But now you got so much time, you don't know what to do with it. We send ahead what is precious to us, to the Father's house, our talent, our time, our treasure, our materials. When we give tithe, we send ahead. But who gave you all this stuff? Your talent, your time, your, your, your money, all, your breath, your, even your family, your children? Who gave you all that? It is God. He just entrusted them to you for temp, just small, a short period of time, temporarily. He committed into your hands, you send them back to him. But it is not lost for you. Because in that day, you will arrive in the Father's house. He will hold your spirit in his hands. What else do we need to send ahead? What else do we need to commit? Listen very carefully. If you stop praying, and I know you have, many of you have, stop praying. When do you pray? Well, I pray all throughout the day. Really? Prayer is the act of committing your problems in the hands of the Father. So if you don't pray, and you have stopped praying, and you know who you are, you have stopped coming on your knees and stopped coming to the house of prayer for whatever reason. You have stopped committing your problems in the hands of the Father. So how do you expect that he will take your spirit, take your soul when you die? How do you expect that you will go to heaven when you don't practice it today? It's simple logic, you understand? We shouldn't believe just because of logic, but I'm trying to make it like make it simple for you to understand. You want to go to the Father's house? You want to be saved? You want your spirit to be sent to the Father's house in that day? Live this day by sending ahead your precious things and even your problems. When you kneel down and say, you are my only help. You alone are my only help. You are committing your problems in the hands of the Father, not in the hands of the world. You want your problems to be solved? You complain, you mope, and you're depressed, but you don't pray. God help you. How do you expect for help to come when you don't seek him? You expect some Santa Claus to magically understand, and let's see what your problem is. That's Santa Claus. That's not God. You understand? You have to know God. Who is God? He is the Lord of faith. Jesus, your Lord, is the Lord of faith. Who does he seek? What does he seek? He seeks men of faith. He's not here to be, let me see what people are in need. I'm going to give just any way I want. That doesn't work. You have to commit your spirit, your time, your treasures, even your problem, your desperate situation ought to be in his hands then he will save you. I am desperate for my soul and for your soul, God. May God have mercy on your souls. Commit your souls, your spirit in the hands of the Father daily, starting on your knees throughout the day, through the week. Get a wake-up call. If you have stopped praying, if you have stopped relying on him, wake up. He's your only help. He's only, your only answer. He will find those few with faith. And only those few with faith will be taken home with him in that day. Let us pray. Let's close our eyes. And really even for a moment. Be honest and be genuine for one moment. For one moment. Even if you're the most 
goofy person. You need to be serious when it comes to your death and the life after your death. It is coming. We are all going to leave this world one day. We just don't know when. But when we do, where will our spirits be? Where will your spirit be in that day? And how can you be sure? If you want your spirit to be received by the Father, commit your life to Him today. Pray. Commit your problems to Him today. And give up. Lay down and throw. Send away to Him. He will feed you. He will heal you. He will save you. Lift your hands up and cry out His name. Yes, Yeshua. these words after me father father into your hands i commit my soul again father into your hands into your hands i commit my soul my soul financial, health, family, legal, whatever it is, so many problems. Who do you look to? Who's the source of your help? Who is your rock? If it is Jesus as you say with your lips, why don't you live it with your body? Commit your problems into the hands of the only one who can resolve your problems. Pray again. Oh, into your hands I commit my life. Take care of my problem for me. I cannot resolve my problem. I cannot live this life of my life on my own. I belong to you. My problems are in your hands. Pray again. to none but the Lord of faith to whom nothing is too hard to Jesus nothing is too hard to Jesus there is nothing impossible have faith in him pray that your brother and your